First item is to uh, approve the minutes from October 14th. I move that we, we uh, accept the minutes from the previous meeting. Second, all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. <laughs> Vendor and payroll warrants. Um, uh, does anybody have any comments? I have no comments. Okay, I'm good. Uh, do we motion that, Brian, or is that just done? Um, that's just done if you don't have any comments. No, okay, good. Um, I assume everybody's got the agenda, so we're looking for public comment on items not on the agenda. So no cheating. Anything for anybody? Well, I'll, I'll say one. I'll echo a um, an email chain that I saw. I guess yesterday, uh, maybe, um, just saying that that even the highway crowd did a phenomenal job on Chestnut Plain Road, um, and the the lining even even happened. It just snuck in all of a sudden. Um, all of a sudden, it, it, I don't think it was lined. Did you line that this morning, uh, today, Keith? Last night. Oh, last night under the cover of darkness. All right. No, you did a really good job. Thank you. So, um, okay, election update, Lynn. Um, I'm not quite sure, Brian asked, said that Fred was kind of interested in learning what was going on with the election. And so I'm not quite sure what he was looking for, but I can kind of give you a rundown. Um, we're doing quite well on our early voting. Um, well, first of all, we have 1,257 registered voters and right now, 51% of them have already voted. So, um, again? 51% of the town's voters have already mm -hmm. cast ballots. Aren't we awesome? <laughs> well, meaning you. What percent <laughs> well, voted in 2016, Lynn? Total. In total, 89.7%. Okay. Wow. So we got a ways to go, but. But still, um, so 204 of them were early voting in person and 421 of them are er early voting by mail and 13 of them are absentee ballots. Um, and I think there was some um, question about letting people know what the deadlines are for various things. So the last day to request either an absentee ballot or an early vote ballot by mail is uh, was today at five o'clock. So that's a little bit late for people, but um, there's still early voting until Friday. So tomorrow will be open from eight to four and Friday from nine to noon for, for early voting. Um, and then of course you've got election day, which will uh, the election will be held at the town hall from seven in the morning till eight at night. Um, so that's your last option. Those people who have still not sent in their early vote by mail ballots, which I have, I think 84 that is still out there. Um, they have, if they mail the ballot, it has to be postmarked by November 3rd. And then I have to receive it by November 6th. We'll have another round of counting ballots um, on November 9th uh, to count those ballots that are received prior to five o'clock on November 6th. If people drop them in the drop box, they have to be dropped in the drop box by eight o'clock on election day. So um, if you try dropping it in the drop box mm -hmm. after that, it will be considered late and will not be counted. Um, let's see. And I also wanted people to know that we, under a directive from the Secretary of State's office, they are asking that we shut down our ballot boxes on our after hours boxes on Halloween. So I am our box will be closed from three o'clock on Saturday afternoon until nine o'clock on Sunday morning. <clears throat> Uh, mainly because of some of the incidents that have happened in other areas. Um, I've also installed a camera on our, our after hours box so that we can pick up any 
questionable activities at the box, none of which we've had yet, none of which I'm expecting either. So um, I don't know, did you folks have any specific questions? So just to be really clear about what you just said, is that if someone wants to drop off their ballot, their ballot, they have to do it during hours when someone is there. Not necessarily. It's only going to be shut down for Halloween evening. Um, oh, from okay. Three That's in Halloween. the afternoon until nine on Sunday morning, and then I'll leave it open for the twenty-four-seven after that. Okay. Okay. Understood. I think they're just afraid of the of activity on Halloween. On that one night. Yeah. Yeah. Understood. Okay. So. And and Lynn is Waitley uh, or Massachusetts? I guess probably is the, the fair question. Uh, one of the states or town that uh, counts the ballots as they come in, or do you wait until the polls close to, to count the ballots on election day? We have options in town uh, or in Massachusetts. We have what's called advanced removal and advanced depositing. I am going to do advanced removal, which just means that I can take the ballots out of the envelopes they're coming in and and bundle them up into packages that will be ready for counting on election night. Because we're a paper ballot community, um, we don't have the option of actually processing ballots. Those people who have tabulators can actually run their ballots through the tabulator. Okay. They can't run a tape to determine the results, but they can run them through. So it's all recorded in the tabulator um, and then it will be tallied on election night. But um, we are not allowed to do that as a paper ballot community. Gotcha, okay. Does the public have any questions for our town clerk? No? Okay, um, Lynn, I think we're good unless you wanna add anything else. No, I'm, I'm fine. Good. Okay. We'll, we'll enjoy the next few days, Lynn. I'm sure you'll have uh, a ball. Yeah, it's been a, a crazy month. So it'd okay. be nice to get a weekend again. Right, right. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and I'll encourage people to not trust the mail and, and, and get, uh, and get going in, into the drop box. That's what I used. You don't get out of your car. It's beautiful. Although I do um, yeah, it in person. I would encourage people to use the Dropbox at this point in time. Um, the mail has been pretty good, and they stress that they are working very hard at trying to get those ballots processed on a timely basis, but uh, to be on the safe side. Plus, we're use, doing early voting in person um, for the rest of the week here. So you can also drop your ballot in the office if you want to actually hand it to a person. So that's another option. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Appreciate it a lot. Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. -bye. Okay. Um, George, I guess it is all you as the water commissioner on record that I see in the group. Yeah, I'm not sure where George Ann is. Right. She's here. She's just Ms. Wayne, but I'll go no, over. she's she's she on have? her just on her cell phone, George. Oh, okay. She's a 413-512-1456. Yeah, that's her. Okay. Okay, water commissioner report. What's up? Well, we Wayne and I had talked to our candidate oh back quite a few months ago, and he seemed very you know, positive that he wanted to join the group. And he's, I think he can bring a lot to the commission. Uh, George Ann had talked to him all oh, back last week, I think, or the week before, and she was impressed with him too. So I think we have a good vote, you know, we'll vote unanimous for him. So, so George, help me out. Um, obviously this is uh, to replace the vac a vacancy or to fill a vacancy on the water commissioners. What's the person's name that we're talking about? It's John. I'm not sure, Wayne. His last Lucan. name. Yeah, John Lucan. Lucan. John Lucas. John Lucas. L-U-K-I-N. Okay. 
Okay, great. Um, then um, you guys are recommending that the select, no, does select board <clears throat> vote on this, Brian? Yeah, uh, it's a joint vote by the water commissioners and the select board. So someone okay. will need to make a motion and then we would do okay, roll call so vote because we're virtual. George or, George or Georgiana, do you want to um, make a motion to, to nominate uh, Don Lucan? Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor, uh, George. Aye. George Ann. Uh, Aye. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Joyce. Me, I. Uh, the vote is unanimous. Okay. Um, unless the water commissioners would like to report on anything else, uh, we are moving on. No, I think we're doing good. Okay. And, uh -huh. and, uh, yeah. And congratulations to Mr. Lucan. Um, I don't see Paul yet, so we will move past Paul. But when Paul comes here um, at the next at, at the next transition, we will go back to Paul and the discussion of Watermelon Wednesdays. Um, Waitley Historical Society to discuss a plan to resume activities at the museum. I see Adelia. Neil Neil is my speaker. Oh, I see Neil too. Okay, I'm sorry, Neil. Hi, this is to follow up on the earlier meeting uh, to discuss this topic uh, with the select board. Uh, and as I understand it, the select board asked the Historical Society to consult with the Board of Health, which we did through multiple co correspondence by email. Uh, and we have provided you with the revised plan for opening uh, the spaces in the town hall for use by the Waitley Historical Society. Uh, and uh, I'll just say that one of the things that was advised by the um, Board of Health as optimal when there are uh, multiple people in a space is to have fresh air uh, and to circulate in fresh air so that you don't have stagnant uh, air uh, and we, for security reasons and um, and um, storm window reasons, we don't have a way to open the windows in the museum space, uh, but we can open the door to the hallway and uh, get some air circulation, but following what the town has chosen to do, both for uh, the election voting, uh, both for the primary and for the election and for the town offices, we have ordered an air purifier uh, for the historical society to use uh, that has the capacity to fully circulate all the air through the, all the air in the room through the purifier in 15 minutes. And so that will help to reduce any residual uh, aerosols that uh, might be uh, in, in the air from uh, multiple people who uh, might otherwise be somewhat contagious, though we, we propose not to admit anyone who's showing uh, symptoms or who has uh, been in contact recently with those who uh, have been diagnosed positive. Uh, so we think this meets the needs. Uh, we are hoping to begin as soon as the uh, select board uh, approves the plan to have occasional small groups. Uh, we are authorized at the moment to have one person at a time in the space um, and only a few people, mainly uh, Derek Smith has been in occasionally, Adelia has been in occasionally, uh, but we'll have small groups uh, socially distanced uh, working on projects uh, once you give uh, approval to this plan. Uh, and I think the only question uh, if you find the plan acceptable is whether the air purifier is required or uh, only recommended and whether the number of people should be limited below six uh, until the air purifier arrives. We're expecting it uh, about the first uh, week of December. Um, my only question, and I'd love to have Fran's input as well, but I'm going to jump in and give give my question a, a shot here. Um, 
you know, that's a pretty small space. And six foot distancing with masks, I, I'm assuming you guys have measured the space, but I can't imagine you can fit more than three people in that space and, 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 and have the, the six foot social distancing guideline adhered to. Is that not accurate or? That, that's not accurate. accurate. The, uh, the width of the space is about 18 feet. The <laughs> length of the space is about 30 feet. Uh, so you have lots of places that are six feet apart. You could have six people and be spaced at 10 foot intervals and still be, be within the museum space. Okay, I, I, I guess, and, and you know, forgive me, but I guess I was thinking because of all the physical structures in there, the exhibits, et cetera, it, it, again, this is based upon memory. So I apologize, but there is limited places. There are limited places to sit or stand. So it's not that we have a big room that all spots are, are easily utilized for sitting or standing. That, that's my only concern. The, there, there is a center display case or meeting table down the center uh, of the room, and there are uh, display cases or shelves on the two sides. Uh, the aisles are, uh, um, people could stand in the two aisles and be uh, more than six feet apart uh, in the two aisles, and the length of the aisles run the full length of the room. So. So you, you could, in the spaces where people can stand and work on surfaces, uh, you could easily meet uh, the six foot distance. And if for some reason it got crowded and we couldn't meet the six foot distance, then we would uh, limit to the number of people who could safely be six feet apart. Okay. Joyce, do you have anything or do you wanna to go to Fran? I was just thinking, um... That room is, it's like those tents in Harry Potter. They're just bigger on the inside, you know? Because mm -hmm. I, I would not have guessed that it was 18 by 30. Um, but I did sort of feel like six seemed like that was, that was gonna work so long as you uh, could, you know, kind of be on the other side of obstacles and things like that. And I think if the Board of Health has signed off on it, then I'm, um, I, I think it's probably then well thought out and uh, certainly meets what we know of uh, for safety standards now. Um, as for the uh, air filter, um, I think the thing is written without the air filter and if it's safe without the air filter, then I don't see a reason to put an additional restriction on. I'm sure your members will be aware of, yeah, this air filtration system will come. And so maybe some people will decide to wait until that's installed. But I, I'm not sure that I have the, the you know the 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 know you know the the knowledge base to say whether oh well if it's not six what should it be I have no idea, so um, I'm inclined to kind of not worry about the the air purifier so much. I'm glad you're doing it. I have one in my lab that I work in at Smith, uh, which clears the air in something I can't remember how many times per hour, but it's it's a, similar to what you're talking about. And um, it's not proof because nobody's gotten sick there, but, it, but it, it certainly makes people feel better about going into a room that other people have been in when you're not there, even if they're not there at the same time. I think that's a good idea. Let me, if I may, let me just say that I think, uh, and, and Brian raised this as we discussed the plan uh, with him. Uh, of course, the advice is that people with higher risk factors uh, will be safer if they reduce the time that they spend with other people. Uh, and so I think we'll be careful to advise those uh, who might have health conditions that put them at greater risk to come for short visits or short projects rather than extended periods uh, with others. Fran? Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate that we have been in touch and had correspondence, email correspondence, and this draft is, reflects that. I don't see the air purifiers in there, which we certainly would recommend, given the airflow situation or lack thereof in, in this building. And so I, um, you know, I think we would uh, hope that the uh, purchase occurs 
before the people start going and using this or that it's in place by that point. Since there's no, um, even with many split circulating, um, you know, internal air, it's, it, there's no fresh air otherwise. So we need something uh, that would at least purify it to limit the exposure. I mean, in general, the, the Board of Health is not encouraging any indoor gatherings, but this one has been thought out. Uh, and I think, you know, as, as Neil mentioned, if you take all the precautions that is, there are in this document and um, follow them along with um, the air purification, it's probably the best we can get and allow that use um, to happen. Okay. Um, are there filters we can put on those um, uh, mini splits? Are there additional filters? I thought there, we might've actually talked about that at a previous meeting. Mm. Mm. I know the library. Right, go ahead. The, well, the library's installed something called iWave systems. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if those are appropriate for the mini splits that we have in town hall. I emailed our um, HVAC company today inquiring what they might recommend. Oh, okay. Um, in terms of filters or I think the iWave system does something with ionization of the air in it. I don't really understand all that, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just makes it a more efficient filter if the, if the particles are ionized. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know that you can get to the HEPA filter level of yeah. uh, filtering with the mini split um, and the, the air purifier uh, would certainly provide what is called yeah. a super HEPA filter, which is a, uh, a hospital level uh, mm. HEPA filtering. I've only got, I've, I've got one request and one unsolicited piece of advice. Having been responsible for social distancing with gatherings in town, I, I would just caution to the people who run the historical society that mm -hmm. it's really hard to ask people to, when you see people not socially distancing, it's, it's a gut check to ask them, especially when you, if you don't know them well, and to, to say, hey, can you please, you know, separate or, or you know, you got to put the mask over your nose and mouth, just not your mouth. But those kinds of things are hard to do. So it's just, I, I would encourage a frame of mind to be, to be created so that you just, you just got to overcome those anxieties, which is only natural to, to say, please, can, can we just do it? Um, and then the only, the only request that I would have, and I don't see it here, though I may have missed it, is that I'm a big believer that we should have some kind of a, a, a sign in so that we can do contact tracing in the event that someone does come down with COVID. A good idea. I, I think that's an excellent idea and we'll make that as part of the entry protocol right up with uh, using the hand sanitizer um, uh, on entry. It'll be to, to sign in. So we'll have time and date uh, arrival and departure time uh, for, for everyone who's there. I'll also say that we're anticipating these are mainly uh, the contributing members of the Historical Society. They know each other well, they're used to working together and they're used to telling each other what to do. So I don't think there'll be any hesitation uh, in sharing reminders about the protocols. Okay, all right, just, just a friendly reminder, that's, you know, but I, I, I appreciate the, the contact tracing addition. Yeah. And as, as, we, as we said, uh, it's the people with the keys who have to be there to let people in and out, both from mm -hmm. the front door and into the museum room that will take the primary responsibility for uh, reminders about the protocols. Okay. Um, Joyce, you want to make a motion? Uh, I would um, move then that we uh, approve the Historical Society's use of the town hall space that they rent with the policy that they provided today. Um, I, I would second with the caveat that, I, I, that they have indicated that they will include the contact tracing step. Uh, in this protocol. Yeah, that's a friendly amendment, yeah. Yeah. Um, so all those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Me, aye. Unanimous. Does the Historical Society have any other questions or comments before we move on? Oh, thank you. No, 
you guys did exactly the way it's supposed to work. You create protocol, you get feedback, you amend the protocol, uh, and when everyone's happy with it, then we can move forward. Um, so I, I think this is great. It's, it's the way it's supposed to work. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll work on the necessary signs. And as I noted in the policy, uh, we do now have a doorbell on the front door so that the people in the museum uh, can hear that someone has arrived at the door. There are only a few of us who have keys. Uh, and so others who come will ring the bell and can be identified and admitted. Okay, perfect. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. We'll send you the revised policy, including the, the sign in, sign out for contact Great. tracing. Uh, Great. As Thank the you. Final version. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Fran, you're up. Uh, we have Fran Fortino here to discuss uh, the Valley Neighbors and their uh, their initiative, uh, proposed initiative to uh, make Waitley an age-friendly designated uh, town. Um, so we uh, sent in some material. Well, Paul just arrived. So if you want to take him first. Um, no, you go, and then we'll go, with, go back to Paul. OK. So. Um, I don't know how much you've read in the background materials that we sent, but this age-friendly friendly initiative is uh, something that's nationwide, actually worldwide, um, derived from a WHO um, initiative. And it would um, uh, essentially designate Wheatley, um, who would join now Sunderland and Deerfield um, as age-friendly communities, which involves then um, some assessment and needs assessment, particularly for senior citizens. And in our community, uh, you're probably all aware, we have 35% or more now of people in that age category, 60 or older, and it's only getting older. And it's true for the other communities. So um, that the letter um, of enrollment is, is what we're asking the select board to take a look at and, and uh, sign or put together. Um, I think in the materials I sent, there are several options, several other examples of that. Um, once that goes in, there's an application form uh, link to which I think I also forwarded. I don't know if you had a chance to see it. Um, but overall, there's then, uh, after the application, the letter goes in, there's a um, another process that gets us to uh, a needs assessment, and that would be an open community needs assessment. Um, we're working, we're hoping to work with the other two towns that are um, part of Valley Neighbors and are closely allied already um, with the senior center, Sunderland and, and uh, uh, Deerfield. And we, we've talked with the senior center director and she's happy to have partners here. <laughs> and Another partner is LifePath, which has got a bigger grant to work on this and um, work with the community. So I think a lot of the work on the community needs assessment and um, the planning after the needs assessment will be facilitated with uh, their help. And um, at that point, whatever we come up with some kind of a plan, hopefully a regional one, we can start looking for funding and um, hopefully getting things in place that would make our communities more age, quote, age friendly. And that could mean anything from, you know, some kind of park now after our great sidewalks have gone in, thanks Keith. Um, but there's no real park there for like elderly to sit down on a bench and stuff. So things like that, but also all the way up to regional public transportation of which we don't have a lot. And, you know, the connections between our communities for people who don't drive is very, diff are very difficult. So that's a little bit of an overview. I'm happy to answer questions, but that's sort of what we're aiming for uh, on a regional basis to work with our, you know, neighboring towns on this. Joyce, um, Pardon? Joyce, Joyce, do you have anything to uh, add? Any questions for Brian? 
I thought what the, the material you sent sounds like it's all to our advantage to to do this. I don't see any downside unless unless I missed it, in which case my question would be, is there any downside? I don't see any. Most of the you know, there's no money commitment here. That at some point, you know, if there's a a plan that that's developed after we're all um, surveyed and have a needs assessment, and we, you know, we would try to go to state agencies to help leverage that, as as other communities have done. Mm. But I think it's that's really easy. a plus, right? Because then you've yes. got something to put into your grant application that might make it a stronger application. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and the grant application, we can, you know, we could help you work put together as needed, uh, you know, if it's, it is a bit long and a, you know, that requires a little bit of thought, <laughs> but I think uh, we are happy to help with that one too. So I don't think there's a downside at this point or even down the line because, uh, you know, there's no financial, at least at this point, no financial commitment and probably not going to be one. There's no mandatory anything in this so it's just a way to look at planning around seniors and our aging communities and making um, you know, adjustments or any, any in the physical and in the social environment to make that more, um, more the case. You know, we could even consider you know, senior, se senior housing. I don't know, it's been talked about, but <laughs> you know, there, is, there isn't any in uh, the three communities. So. Um, it's dedicated to your house. Bran, I, I have a question. I, I'm, I'm a cynical person when it comes to uh -huh. um, transportation routes being increased uh, in downtown <laughs> Waitley. Uh, uh -huh. Much to my disappointment, I just am, I'm, I'm a cynic when it comes to that ever happening. Um, uh -huh. That being said, I think we have a much better shot at um, other ways to make mobility easier for seniors um mm -hmm. and i'm i'm wondering i know Sunderland and deerfield have done this but what about hatfield northampton and amherst and the reason i ask is that i very much believe that there will be grants available at some point to create the infrastructure for driverless cars uh in rural areas i i think that it that is the solution to seniors not being able to drive uh, but that requires um uh connectivity in sidewalks uh it, it requires an awful lot of of, of high-tech infrastructure grants will become available but it doesn't do as much good for people to be able to go from waitley to centerland to deerfield in a circle but if they can get to northampton and amherst or greenfield well, even so i'm wondering whether there's a movement for these in all areas so we could so when it comes to grants we mm -hmm. could do a, a, a regional initiative so that our seniors really do have access to things like driverless cars. Well, yeah, uh, you know, that's sort of down the line, but uh, definitely. And when I mentioned uh, public transportation access and increasing it, that's uh, sort of what we had in mind, hooking up to getting to a hub where we can get then get to uh, FRTA to Greenfield and or PVTA to get to uh, Northampton, Amherst, Hadley. And you know, right now there is no connection. Right. So, so um, that there used to be, at least from the PVTA perspective, you could get to Deerfield, you could get on any bus, and FRT has uh, one shuttle or one bus that zooms by Waitley. If there's, I don't know if it still stops, but you know, those are bigger state sort of pro uh, issues that you know we could work on as a region. And that's one of the aspects. If you're thinking about uh, <laughs> driverless cars, you know, that infrastructure, that's going to take a while to build up. But uh, I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't put that on the agenda for regional transportation um, goals, too. So, so is, Hat, is, is Hatfield, Northampton, and Amherst doing this? Because those are the towns that would be necessary to get people to any of those three larger communities of Greenfield, Northampton, and Amherst. Uh, they're part of this um, overall uh, group that LifePath has convened that um, 
have, uh, actually I don't know if Northampton and Amherst are part of it because this is kind of a Franklin County focus. Um, but, you know, if you can get to, uh, like I said, if you can get to a hub that serves those communities, whether, you know, Deerfield or, or someplace, we can, um, you know, move the needle a little bit on getting people to Amherst and Northampton. I don't know, and I, 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 they may have applied, but they're not in inside this Franklin County groups right. um, thing. But we can look into it. There may be others. There, there's a statewide listing of um, of age friendly communities or age friendly communities in uh, development. So we could check that out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I will make a motion to Brian. Help me here. Um, to designate at the recommendation of um, of Fran, I, I would make a, uh, a motion for Whitley to become an age-friendly community. I would second that. <clears throat> All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Me, aye. Unanimous. <laughs> Does anybody have any comments now that we've made that vote? I'm sorry I didn't ask. <laughs> So Fran, you need you need a letter of support from the select board and we need to complete an application. Is that yes. true? Yes. Okay, so I'll draft up the letter for the board to sign. Mm -hmm. And then we can work on a plan if you want to work on it or we can work on it outside and submit it to you guys. It okay. doesn't have to be from the select board um, given, you know, the, it's, it's the buy-in is from the select, from select persons in each town, but after that, it could be a regional initiative, et cetera, and um, whatever. So I think the plan, uh, the application is, is a little more specific. So and I'd, I'd be glad to work on it with, with you, Brian, or somebody. Okay. Okay. And the Valley Neighbors plays a role in this because, you know, in the, in, in the short term, that's what we are proposing is to provide transportation where there is none for people who can't drive or, or have no access to transportation. So we're, we're hopeful that all that can happen too in a, in, in a, <laughs> a year maybe. <laughs> so. I think, Fran, I gotta be honest. I think you have a better shot at the driverless cars before you have a shot at the, <laughs> anyway. Oh yeah. Well, um, yeah. Technology is a beautiful thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so Brian, you'll take care of that. You'll stay in touch with Fran uh, and let us know if we need to take any other steps that we're happy to do. Um, Fran, you might want to stick around for this next one um, yeah. because we're going to invite Paul to turn on his camera if he so chooses yeah. and talk about uh, Watermelon Wednesdays <laughs> and using um, uh, Town Hall as um, a streaming and or live venue. So mm -hmm. Paul, all you. Well, um, okay, great. I, I'm i just here to find out what the conditions are before. I can't decide what my options are until I know what my constraints are. So <clears throat> um, I was hoping to be able to use the town hall to at least do recordings of an artist or two or maybe three. And that would that would require about two hours, <clears throat> two hours use of the town hall on occasion, depending on how how much more, how many more concerts I, I want to do. Um, and I have somebody lined up for this Sunday to record. I was hoping to do it in the chapel, but I think it's going to be too cold. Uh, and I really, I, I don't feel comfortable doing it in my house because we don't have uh, big enough spaces, but the town hall's a big space. Um, the artist is a harp player. And so there would be a harp player and one or two photog video, video audio people and me. So there would be four people probably in the upstairs or it could be downstairs, um, but that's up to you guys. Um, as are any other conditions. Like if I, you know, I don't know about having an audience at all. I don't think most of my clients, most of my people would go to an indoor concert anyway. So I, I think that's really not 
not a factor. So I'm really talking about uh, live streaming or recording and then showing at a, another time. So this concert, if, if I was able to record it on Sunday afternoon around two o'clock, I would air it on Wednesday at 7.30 over the Watermelon Wednesday's YouTube station. So that's... Yeah. I think you're muted. Yes, I know. Uh, the uh, town hall auditorium is set up for elections uh, with voting booths, uh, <laughs> tables, chairs arranged. Uh, the stage is occupied. Um, so I think until that has been dismantled after Tuesday, it would be difficult to use the auditorium. Well, in that case, I could postpone the recording um, for a week or two. I don't have any set date, so it, I'm very flexible about this. I, I just say that after that, it would be uh, easily rearranged uh, okay. to, to whatever your needs are. But, but we left it set up. Uh, Lynn asked if there was anything scheduled uh, when it was first set up for the primary. And uh, then uh, since nothing else was scheduled, we said leave it set up for the general election, uh, which is next Tuesday. Then it will be cleared. Um, and there are protocols for town hall already created in terms of social distancing. No, they're not. Brian is shaking his head. No, the, the, the town hall has been closed since March. Okay, so I, I guess, Paul, what I would suggest is that you do what we've asked anyone to do who wants to utilize space is to create protocols that would be followed um, for the board and the board of health, the select board and the board of health to assess whether all steps are being taken to keep people safe and healthy um, from, from attracting uh, the coronavirus. Um, th that's, that's me, I, I say that's everybody, and I know I get people mad at me, but I, it's just the way it goes. Right. Um, that's what I would suggest. And, and you know, Adelia, I'm sure, or Brian would share the protocols that they just um, utilized for us to allow um, the historical society to use their room and have and have walk-in guests uh, as well because it's a good it's a good template to use and and I'm sure Fran will help you with nuances that are unique to the watermelon Wednesdays. That would be my that would be my suggestion. I would add to that. I think it's a, a it, it's a little more complicated than the historical society because the historical society is talking about a uh, a single room. And granted, they rent the room, but I think that's maybe less important. They're always going to use that room, and no one else is going to use it in between. They have complete control of that space, right? Um, the big room, if we start letting one group use it, we probably have to start letting other groups use it. We have to be, um, we have to be pretty. You know, we have to be even-handed about it. We can't just favor one group over another. For uh, you know, Although we do have, I think, written into our rules that we're going to favor local Waitley-based groups over, uh, over outside groups. Uh, I don't have any problem with that. But there's other things that you have to, we'd have to consider. Like, you know, after someone uses it, it somebody's got to go through and do some sanitizing. Right. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, our custodial staff is kind of stretched at the moment to take care of the needs we have for sanitizing at even the smaller number of buildings we have open because, well, because you need more sanitation than we used to need. Okay. So there's, um, it, it puts, um, I think there, there might actually be a little higher standard here for groups that are going to use a room that maybe another group is going to use later. And it might be that each group has to come up with some kind of protocols, but it sure seems to me like it's not just let's take the one the historical society used and just use that. It can't. It can't be. And I, I don't think anybody was proposing that necessarily. But I think it. I, I just want it to be recognized that this this is kind of a bigger 
um, a, a bigger thing because it's not uh, such a, like a, an enclosed space that it's going to be the same people using all the time and the same group of people using all the time. Right. Okay, I was a lot more comfortable with that for the Historical Society after they talked to the to the, the Board of Health. And my point certainly is that that and again I use their 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 template their protocols as a template that but protocols are always about who's going to disinfect the 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 areas being utilized who's going to clean who's going to what's the bathroom protocol going to be all this kind of stuff has to you know a, a protocol can be exhausting uh, mm -hmm. as everyone knows so <clears throat> I'm just saying that if for for me to be either comfortable or uncomfortable with it. I would need to see the protocols that have been listed to assess whether I'm comfortable with, with that usage. Um, you know, one heart, you know, and, and what the protocols are, if it's, if it's people, um, meaning it's a harpist and, and a couple of people who are recording as opposed to a larger group. And so it, it, it can get exhausting, but that's, I'm just saying that I would want to see those at a minimum, and I would encourage you to work with 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 Fran on that. Yeah, we're we're happy to do that. In fact, we sent some guidelines already on uh, the usage, but I think it's uh, as Joyce mentioned, this is really a, a town uh, issue. It's a town building. It's just the uh, standard should be how are we going to approach? I believe how are you going to approach it for all users of that space, and what what is the minimum protocol for use of that space? Um, a, a not, you know, somebody may come in with a, something like the historical society or they may not. And, um, but if we have something in place that says, okay, you have to meet these minimum standards and minimum protocols, um, then it, it, you know, it might not, they might not even require that as long as there's a, a separate outside um, protocol from each and every user, as long as they understand what the town needs to have done. So, yeah. this is, I, I think that's uh, probably true for all town buildings. I don't know, but you know, this is. Right. It's, yeah, because like it, my understanding is we've been asked by people who want to hold hold a dance class up there. Yeah, and we know mm -hmm. they like singing, shouting talking at loud voice, those are the things that produce both droplets and aerosols. And those aerosols can stay around for weeks. <coughs> um, yeah. So you're you're not just sharing the space with the people you're with, you're sharing the space with the people who were there last week, mm -hmm. especially with singing. I mean, singing produces so much. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that that's something that would happen that could happen at any kind of event i suppose but um I, I think we have to be careful especially given the ventilation um the ventilation that we've got there which is not mm -hmm. a heck of a lot yeah so yeah. so I, I i guess i'm i'm you know i i would i don't want to say like no outright because i'm not enough of a public health professional i did go see a a, a a workshop and a guy gave a talk summarizing all the research on on aerosols and how mm -hmm. long they stay in the air and what can be inside those aerosols and even if the aerosol even if the particle mm -hmm. dries out that virus is still viable if yeah. it gets if you breathe that in and it goes into your wherever the lungs throat you know it it's it can still be viable you can catch that so mm -hmm. um yeah, it made me just want to kind of stop breathing, but I realized that's not really going to, that's not a viable option either, right? So anyhow, um, I, I definitely think we, we have to think uh, not just about whether we want Paul to be able to record some shows there, but we have to think about, well, how does this apply to all the different kinds of users that may want to, to mm -hmm. come up? Because we've got to do something that's fair. If we're not perceived as being fair, then, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, can and should be voted out of office right well right and 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 that's why you know but yeah. it, it's the the fairness to me comes into play where i, I will gladly look at any protocol mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean it, 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 it could be easily justified that one protocol works and another protocol just doesn't work 
for uh, public health and safety. And I would always mm -hmm. defer uh, for the most part to, to, to the Board of Health on that. Um, but I just, I just think if, if, if Paul wants to take a shot at writing a protocol to I'm see if we're comfortable, I, I, I think that's great. I just can't guarantee that um, that will ex that I will accept it. Um, but I know that if Fran's involved and Fran feels comfortable, I'll be more willing to look at it. Well, um, my I don't mind drafting, uh, you know, creating a draft of protocol for use of the town building. But I think that's inefficient. Uh, I think the town should have their own protocol that potential users can sign off on or not mm -hmm. as they see fit. Yeah. And that way, every proposed, every uh, mm -hmm. person who wants to use the facility do doesn't have to draft their own protocol and go through various meetings to get it approved or revisions. Yeah, no, yeah like that's our point. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I was suggesting. Yes. Okay, so I will postpone plans for Sunday. And then um, I guess work with Fran to come up with a protocol. Yeah, well, and or Brian, who has um, the town's interest here, I suspect, right? So we could, um, this isn't just for this space or this time, but uh, potentially other town buildings for use for outside groups. Right, right. I, I mean, although this one has a special set of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, restrictions given the airflow situation or lack right. of. Right, but the, I mean the, the the protocol for use of, of that building, you know, just music alone, and Joyce alluded to it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a different protocol for a harpist as opposed to a French hornist, or a singer. Yeah, she or, or a singer. I mean, you know, any 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 instrument, trumpet, French uh, French horn. You know that that the, the, the droplets are being emitted from that from that instrument mm -hmm. in a different way than droplets are are not emitted by definition from a harp. So yeah. I, I just want to make sure that we understand that it has it has it has to be exhausted protocols. Yeah, if it's, if, if it's going to be something that's like one size fits all, really has to be exhaustive. And I, I don't know that we want that. I mean, so so there's kind of the tension, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it might be that for for one group, uh, some protocols might might not apply. If it's really just people breathing and cameras and mics to catch a harpist, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's one thing. But I don't think we want to have a different policy for every musical group, and it's going to be it's going to be a little trickier to come up with um, protocols that will really fit, uh, you know, that are detailed enough to fit any kind of group who might want to use the town hall. So I, I just know, I know we've got a bigger problem than we, you know, the, the bigger problem will be, oh, you're letting Paul use it. Why can't my dance class come here? Right. Uh, you're letting Paul use it. So why can't my Girl Scouts come here? Right. You're letting, and, and then there's who's going to police the protocols. I mean, that, that's, that's even a whole nother question. Are people actually following them? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's one reason why we've kept it closed for so long. Is that we don't have the resources to police it. Uh, we don't have uh, probably we we didn't. You know, it's the easiest thing to do is to keep it closed, and that's the safest thing. Mm -hmm. So I it, it, I would I want us to proceed with caution, but I don't want us to just say well everything's closed because being closed is the safest thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and so <laughs> it, it will still be the safest thing even when we come up with protocols. It would still be the safest thing to be closed. And and, but, and I'll just add, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna I want Neil to 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 chime in. But I will also add that the exhaustiveness of this protocol, because I'm not aching for the town hall to be used a lot because of the current situation. I also don't want our town administrator to be spending his time on this if it's an inordinate amount of time. We've got a lot of stuff going on and creating protocols be for other organizations because other organizations outside the domain of the town want to use the town hall. I'm not sure that is what we pay our town administrator to do if it's going to take a, 
many, many, many hours because there are only so many hours in the day. So that's why I was sort of putting an, the onus on the organizations, but Neil. So here are a couple of uh, observations from my role as a town hall steward in this case. <laughs> uh, I noticed that some places have gone to propping doors open so that there's less handling of door handles uh, to go in and out of rooms uh, so that if there's more than one person going to come in, in and out of a door, maybe the first person ties the door open, uh, which could be the front door or the back door to the auditorium. Uh, but nonetheless, if there's going to be sanitizing afterwards, then someone should wipe down uh, the door handles that were used, whether it's crash bars or uh, or the, uh, the the door levers, uh, and there would be a question of what else in the in the auditorium needs to be cleaned after a group has used the space. Uh, if you want to clean the air, that might be having an air purifier in the auditorium, and who would who would buy that? Uh, rather than having each group buy their own and bring it and take it away? Uh, would there be a fee so that people contribute towards the cost? The, the Historical Society is spending about $500 uh, to buy the air purifier that will be in the museum. Uh, and and so, so who wipes down what? Uh, there is sanitizer in the bathrooms with a policy that says you'll wipe down whatever surfaces are used. Uh, I think that means toilet seats as well as sinks and uh, and hot and cold water handles. Uh, but uh, who wipes down the the push plates on the doors into the bathrooms? Uh, I, I think that would be for the Board of Health to think about. Would the auditorium be a space that would then require an air purifier? And what would be the cleaning protocol? What surfaces need to be sanitized after each use? Yeah, and we'd also probably consider a size limit if we were making recommendations in that yeah. vein to uh, yeah. under 10, for sure, mm -hmm. at this stage. So, um, yeah, it's a complicated issue because, um, but it, it is a town-owned building and you have every right to come up with some kind of uh, protocol or, or rules, whatever you want to call it, to if if the town is going to open that building um, for usage um, and in what else you know the state has some guidelines for this kind of stuff but and they're out there uh, so it probably could develop something it, it's really somewhat still up in the, the air whether having indoor gatherings at all is a good idea especially where non-related people are coming together but there are mitigating protocols that we could use if, if that's what people want. So, what, One other suggestion, if I may, is, and, <laughs> and Keith is here, so he could, could think about what the options would be. Uh, mm -hmm. If they're going to be multiple users, would we want to go to using the, uh, the housekeeper uh, to be, resume cleaning uh, in the town hall, which is now quite limited, I believe. Uh, and so would you have to do that more often? Would you have that person come in and do a wipe down uh, after each use and, and limit the number of uses so that on a reasonable schedule, uh, that cycle of cleaning surfaces could be done by a town employee rather than uh, putting it entirely on the users. But that's a thought that I know you have other ways to use that person now, and that would be a, additional work or reassignment to, to resume the cleaning, particularly I'm thinking of the bathrooms uh, and maybe door handles and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I can chime in real quick about that. I mean, since the, we closed the town buildings and then once we reopened them at this point in time, the custodian is putting in all of the time that he was devoting between two buildings is now only happening at the town office. So if he's going to do something at the town hall, either we need to pay him more hours 
or reduce what he's doing at the town office. Presently, he's doing the town office Monday, Wednesday, Friday, early in the morning. He's out of there by 7 a.m. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we've run this around a, a fair amount. So um, I will, I guess, leave it to to uh, Fran and Paul to to um, work on something and have Brian involved uh, being cognizant that, that Brian has an awful lot on his plate, um, but he does need to be aware because we are setting a precedent at some level or not at some level, at any level. Um, so I guess, unless anybody has any other questions, I wanna move on to the, to the next agenda item. Does that make sense, Paul, Fran, are you guys good? Yeah, not that we are not bogged down with stuff. <laughs> like no, I can <laughs> I don't know that I want to get involved in developing an exhaustive protocol and then you know, jumping through the hoops. And um, mm -hmm. so I, I may just, you know, decide to wait until, you know, the coast is clear uh, rather than have, mm. have public health problems um, in the space that I may or may not be able to control. It seems like, uh, <sighs> You know, I don't know what's involved in sanitizing a building either. And mm -hmm. I'd rather not get involved in that unless it's just spraying door handles. That's not that onerous. But, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd give it a whirl with Fran if he's, if he's available. I'll postpone <clears throat> concert plans for the foreseeable future in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Um, Brian, before we go to the COVID state of emergency, I, I, I do want to jump in because um, I, I think we should, given any update we potentially have on any discussions that have taken place around the railroad crossing on Christian Lane. Huh. Um, yeah. Um, so after after the last meeting, I reached out to um, um, District Two. I think it's District Two. Yeah, District Two in Northampton to try to um, get any to uh, try to make any headway there, and they punted us over to um, Mass DOT um, Rail right. Division. Yeah. Um, and I know um, I know I was talking with Fred earlier. Fred was on the email as well, and Keith was on the email as well, and and. Fred tried to get a specific contact in Boston because the office is in Boston and he hasn't heard back from uh, District 2 yet as to instead of just starting globally as to who do we contact, um, he was looking for a specific contact and I don't think they've gotten back to him yet. Okay. Keith, do you want to add anything to yeah. that? <clears throat> the only thing I can add in is, you know, after I met that day with Don Dufault, and the representative from Pan Am, and we obviously got nowhere. It, it then became my opinion that we needed to go to the Mass DOT, the rail division. And the only thought I had was to contact the FERCOG, which I contacted Maureen Mullaney. And she then emailed, I don't have it in front of me, but she emailed someone who she thought would be of help and that person hasn't gotten back to her or me either. So um, it's, I don't know, I want to say bureaucracy, but that's still not answering our questions as to if they could at least come and look at the issue at Christian Lane and compare it to the other ones. I think they'll see the difference and try to get a response from them. But so far it's been difficult. Is, is there an executive summary that is written on this sort of a, 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 a Christian Lane rail crossing for dummies um, that I could use um, to share with uh, Congressman McGovern staff? Yeah, I think we could probably draft something up for you to, to give you something to work with. Because I'll because I, I mean I could I I could make a phone call, but I don't want to butcher this. 
Um, so I would prefer to have a cheat sheet of some kind. Yeah, I, why don't I work that, with that, with Brian on that? Okay. Yeah, I, it, at the end of the day, uh, Mass DOT owns the rail, so, um, right? Mass DOT owns it, Pan Am operates on it. So at the end of the day, Mass DOT, uh, the Mass DOT rail division needs, needs, to, needs to be brought to the table. However, we get that. Right, and 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 this cheat sheet would be would would be both a federal and a state yep. um, document that I that I would use because again the the federal government was involved in in making this happen initially in terms of having the the, the rail upgraded, um, so I I would love to have that cheat sheet so I can um, at, at least make a couple calls and if they go somewhere great if they don't well. I don't want to leave a stone un unturned. Is my point. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Snow removal from town-owned properties and sidewalks on Chestnut Plain. Brian and or Keith. You want to do COVID-19? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, do COVID-19. Do you have anything for us or? Although we're all tired of it, right? Yeah. What do you got, Brian? Um... Trying to bring it up real quick. So the only difference that, so I'm gonna bring up the spreadsheet real quick that, that we were looking at last time. Um, just, I just wanna update you on a couple things. One of the big questions at the last meeting was whether, um, PPE costs and other costs to make the school safe was considered FEMA eligible. Um, in that case, they would pay 75% of those costs that we have listed. Um, FEMA has said that that making schools safe is not a is, is not a response cost um, to the emergency. So we're going to have to pay that full amount out of our CARES Act money. Um, and then the other thing that's changed here is uh, we put the purchase in for the for the tent to loan to the the senior center and um, the heater, so the tent and the heater to loan to the senior center, so that they can resume some activities there. Um, and the only other the only thing that was added here was that um, the board of health is looking to use some of that money twenty five hundred dollars um, to purchase uh, vaccine needles in anticipation of, of when the COVID vaccine comes out. Um, so we don't really know what the timing is on that, but um, there, at, there at least have been statements out there. Uh, I don't know if they're reliable or not, but um, they fit our purpose to say that we have a reasonable belief that the benefit of, of those will be used before the, uh, the end of December. Um, so the Board of Health wants to, wants to make that purchase. I just subtracted that from the public health needs amount. Um, Joyce and I have been, um, continuing to work on the on the internet extension part of, of the discussion we had last time in terms of going up North Street. Um, again, we have costs from Comcast, but we got a pretty unfavorable timeline, I think, right, Joyce? Mm. I'd say that. Yeah. Um, in that's terms of what... That's a generous way to say it. <laughs> yeah, in terms of whether they think that they could actually get something done yeah. um, before December 30th. There's always a possibility that uh, the dysfunction in the federal government will go away and we may get a second stimulus or or uh, CARES Act 1 may um, possibly get extended in terms of the deadlines. I don't know if that's that's not a uh, it's not a certainty at this point, but um, we did find out that that the extension of internet to to underserved areas um, would be an eligible CARES Act expense. We got that opinion from um, administration of finance. So we're just really up against the deadline right now that, that might make it not possible. You said it was an, exp an allowable expense or it was not? It, it is an allowable expense as long as it's, so it needs to be related to um, in all practical, pur for practical purposes, it needs to be related to remote learning or, or, or telework. Okay. And that's what would make it eligible. And we would we would want to document that through letters of support and things like that. Okay. Um, but that's kind of where we are now with 
CARES Act funding. Um, and unless there's any question, the next item relates to um, our commitment to Frontier Regional School District. Um, there's a very simple grant agreement that was in the packet. Um, and it really, it just lays out our, our commitment to Frontier and also uh, Frontier's commitment back to us that if at the end of the day, any of, any of the expenses that they incur are not eligible, so, so the town cannot get reimbursed for them, um, Frontier is willing to um, essentially take the hit. Um, so I would recommend that, that the board um, consider signing that grant agreement. The other four towns are, are considering, I can turn this the right way, are considering the same agreement. Is this something we need to vote on or, or have we already sort of done this? Um, so you, so you voted on the, on the commitment to frontier to, at the last meeting, but it would just be a vote to approve the grant agreement. Okay. Well, I, I, under the assumption that I trust, trust Brian, um, I would make, and do you have any questions, Joyce? I'm sorry. Um, no, no, I, I think uh, Brian's was a good summary that um, the, the risk of something not being funded is on Frontier, which I think is a reasonable thing. Yeah. And so I'll make a motion <laughs> to uh, approve this, this agreement with, with uh, Frontier School District. I would second that. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and again, before we go, um, before we go to Chestnut Plain Road and the sidewalks, it, it dawned on me that one thing that we didn't talk about with Lynn and we want to drive the point home, just because people voted early at Fort Sandy Lane and they're dropping off ballots at Fort Sandy Lane and they're using the drop box at Fort Sandy Lane, voting on Tuesday is not at Fort Sandy Lane and it is at 194 Chestnut Plain Road, the old town hall. So please, please, please um, go to town hall to vote and not the town offices. Old business, um, snow removal, Brian or Keith? Gonna snow. Well, yeah, it's obviously snow. the discussion needs to be ironed out, decided. Um, well, we have two two things. First is the the sidewalks, but then also um, the sidewalk entryway at the town office and the snow removal around the, the doors at the town hall. But in regards to the sidewalks themselves, um, I know we've discussed many a times what we want to do, and in the survey that we had asked people, one of the comments was that they wanted them maintained year round. So Brian and I have looked into things a little bit. We've talked about insurance that would be required for outside help to do it and considered some of our options. And here we are to, to further discuss them with you. And Brian has that all in front of him. Do you want to put up that your spreadsheet? Yeah. Probably gonna be really small. Yep. That helps. So I mean, so the the first part here is is winter maintenance needs. These these are our buildings that, and it's just really how we've done it in the past. And the biggest change is that um, Billy Smith and Bill's lawn care had has done it in the past, and they're they're no longer able to do it because. Um, because they don't have the manpower to do it. Um, so our town parking lots, our town buildings are plowed by um, um, Wayne. Uh, we have uh, 
certain amount of money set aside for town buildings that he gets paid out of, and he uses the the water department pickup truck to do that. Um, in terms of the school, the sidewalks are done by the school custodian, and the doors and landings are done by the school custodian. So we really have what I'm trying to get at is we have we have two areas of need. One is town buildings, um, the sidewalks outside the town buildings and the doors and landings, and then we also have the brand new sidewalks um, in Chestnut Plain Road. Um, so I asked around to, this is the bottom party, I asked around to see what some of the other towns do that have, have sidewalks. Um, and it was kind of split actually. Um, some of them, the towns do it. The towns have, some towns have specialized equipment um, that they purchased. Um, Chesterfield had bought a snowblower and they hire a seasonal worker to do the sidewalks in Chesterfield. Um, some of the towns have bylaws that require um, property owners whose property abut the sidewalk to clear the sidewalk within a specified period of time after the storm. Um, Conway uses a small tractor. Um, I know some of the towns have some specialized equipment um, that can do that. So it, it it's really all over the map in terms of what towns do. Um, we got, I got in touch with our, our insurance company and this is the recommendation for insurance for a contractor, if we were to hire, hire a contractor was 1 million, 2 million general liability. And if there's a vehicle involved for $1 million policy with the town named as an additional insured to protect um, the town's interests. Um, so with the sidewalks, the, the sidewalks are, are a little bit different of a job um, than than really just doing a, a small section of sidewalk in the town hall and the, the town offices. Um, sidewalks are, I think Keith measured around 3000 feet. Um, so it's longer, it's straighter. Um, it's likely not gonna be something somebody wants to shovel. So we're gonna be looking, um, it, it might take some type of vehicle or or a while to, to snow blow. Um, whereas the the town buildings could do could be done with a snow blower or, and or a shovel. Um, and so in terms of, in terms of our options, this is the second, the second, uh, card here. Um, some towns hire a contractor, they just contract out, um, the whole entire job and we kind of at the mercy as to what the contractor would, would bid out. Um, other towns will actually put out a bid for it's essentially a contract employee plus equipment. So they're, they're offering to hire um, a contractor um, who will come with a specified piece of equipment and be paid an hourly rate, a set hourly rate. Um, other towns, um, current town employees will do it. They usually do it after the storm, after all the plowing's done. Um, and still some other towns, so we'll hire a seasonal worker to do it. Um, in terms of timing, Keith and I have talked about this. Um, if town buildings are open, there needs to be more frequent snow clearing as opposed to the sidewalk where it's okay if you get to it 48 hours, 72 hours after the storm. Um, so we have a, a wide, really a wide array of needs. And then what what what's new with the sidewalks is, is really in front of the Waitley Inn and probably in front of the library, the parking lot there, and even the town hall with, with the sidewalks, the sidewalks um, on the south side of the parking lot are is that, is that Keith is likely gonna have to do a lot more snow removal. Um, there's not a lot of places to put snow on the sidewalks between the, wait, uh, the parking lot in front of the Waitley Inn and the road, but everybody's gonna be pushing snow into the same location. Um, so that's probably gonna require the highway crew up there to do some more frequent snow removal. Um, so that's the problem. And uh, I don't know, Keith, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I mean, obviously one thing that's really a important factor is in all these cases, there's no funding at town meeting for it because it was, you know, with, when COVID, we were discussing this way back in February and then when COVID came in and every, it just, things got pushed along that were more important. So anyway, especially from a contractor standpoint, we don't have any, there's been no town meeting funding for a line item. 
pay for any of this at this point in time. Um, I know everybody's desire is to maintain them, but we don't have to. Um, I guess that's, you know, more or less what we're here to discuss, whether we will. Um, and as Brian said, there's no doubt about it. I'm going to have to do more snow removal than ever before because we're, you know, places that were used for snow storage no longer can be used. So snow is going to have to be removed after a storm so that subsequently the next storm has a place to be pushed to. So, um, you know, another thing that, you know, in talking with some of these, like in Deerfield and in Thunderland, neither, the only thing that towns do is, is plow them. Um, in the case of Sunderland, they have, they either snow blow it or plow it with the same, same machine. They just switch a plow versus a snow blower. So it depends on what the storm is, the type of the storm. Um, and that's really what this really comes down to is when you can envision every homeowner having their driveway plowed, which where their driveways intersect the sidewalks are going to make, you know, pushing the snow towards the sidewalks, are, which are going to make hard areas if it's being done by a snowblower to get through them. And from a, I just don't, in my own mind, I find it hard to believe that we would be advisable to try to have it done with a walk behind snowblower and having and in some type of employee walking it 3,000 feet. Um, it's all depends on how often they would do it. Um, if we get a foot of wet, heavy snow and it's, you're trying to do it, the snow, uh, if people are familiar with snowblowers, they, they don't work that great with when heavy, wet snow. And um, I'm afraid that, you know, we would get started in the employee would say, I just, I can't do it. I, I'm, um, and then we're in trouble. So, I, you know, I'm not sure. I'm, I don't have the answers. That's why we're here to discuss it. Well, I, I've got two questions actually. Um, one, I'm not convinced this is, this is a complete list of costs because what about, never mind snow, what about ice? What about freezing rain and 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 sanding the, these things? Well, because that's that's the real liability thing here. At this point in time, that was, I should have said that Sunderland and Deerfield do not do any treating. Um, they only do snow removal. Um, that is also the last thing that we want to be doing on our sidewalks in in the proximity of the maple trees. If we're putting any chemicals on it. Um, that's the worst thing that we can do for the maple trees. What about um, sand? Uh, you know, sand, we don't have any, we have nothing. What's going to apply it? I, How are you going to apply it? I, I well, you, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that, Keith, but my concern is, is that, you know, the risk of injury is, is I don't know how data is to support this, but in my mind, the risk of injury is going to be on ice as opposed to trudging through a foot of snow on a sidewalk. And we can say that we don't, you know, that that we don't have the capacity or the ability to to, to distribute sand on icy walkways. But how are we going to feel if somebody hurts themselves? Yeah, I guess that's maybe one thing that we could follow up with the towns that did respond. Um, I, I I just know that Deerfield and Sunderland and those do because I talk to them they don't do any treating but i don't know if anybody else does i don't know if um there's any type of assumed liability for the fact that you are that the towns are plowing them and they're not going to salt them okay mm. all right i i just i just i get really worried about that a lot more than snow removal Joyce? Well, I'm trying to think about, you know, places where I know they do a good job at the snow removal. 
um, that I think there are pieces of equipment that can help you manually spread. Well, not man manually is not the right word. That can help you spread sand. Like I know that we have the big one for the streets, um, but I think there. I mean, maybe that really comes under the category of, you know, looking at that very last column. You know, the two cheaper options of hiring a person to do it, either an employee or an additional employee, plus equipment acquisition. I would think it'd be very important if we were to go that way to have very good equipment. Um, so I'm, I, I'm thinking of these things. I see them uh, running at the college when they're clearing sidewalks there. And it works to some extent on the, the ice after it's been sanded or if it has a little bit of you know, crackle to it. It's, um, it's, it's like a snow thrower, but it's basically got brushes. Like yeah. a, it's like a great big wire brush. Maybe not, it's not wire. Um, and that brush is running backwards and it's uh, a little tilted and it basically brushes the snow off to the side and it can, it removes slush, it removes all kinds of things. Keith is probably- Yeah, that's basically, that. you know, a rotary broom and they, they broom them. That That's very common. And again, when you get the light powder snow, a broom will go and blow that all off very right. nicely. But right. again, that's not gonna work in, a wet snow, so you have to. Right. Okay. My have to work with the with yeah. the storm. Okay. No, it just, but it seems to work really well on campus when there's a small amount of snow, and yeah. like if the if the um, if the tractor has gone by already, and it of course leaves a little bit. The brush coming behind it does you know, a great it, it, job, even if it's heavy snow, because there's not that much left of it. So, I mean, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but no, it's I, like I, the I sidewalk clearing that. equipment is, is, it's a known thing and that we would have to acquire that. And that's a cost that I don't see accounted no. for yet. No, it's not there. And that's because to get into that category, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. You're looking at anywhere from 60 to a hundred thousand dollars to outfit a piece of equipment to do yeah. that. Well, and that now really, moves to the top of the list of costs, isn't it? Yeah, and that's, you know, I don't see us even in that ballpark right now of even considering that. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, whereas uh, you were talking about the, the disadvantages of a snow thrower from the point of view of it's, it's more work for the person who's doing it. Um, but that makes me think maybe that's actually in our... Um, cost range, like the difference between having a contractor do it and having uh, a town employee do it is something like three, four thousand dollars, depending on which contractor estimate you use. Then, boy, it sounds to me like a piece of equipment that's in the three, four thousand dollar range is, is what we could justify if we were to come up with a way to to fund that. And if we can really only get a snow thrower, can we get one? I mean, I know at the school they use a snow thrower, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and it seems to work reasonably well at the school, but I think they also do use sand. Uh, at not at the school, they don't use any sand. Or salt? All salt, yes. Yeah, okay. All, ch all chemicals. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that's just, um, in a bucket thrown by hand because the distance is not that great. No, they have a, see that when you're dealing with like the, the salts, they have actually a, a spreader. Um, oh, they salt, have a spreader. Salt oh. is not as heavy and dense and can oh, okay. easily be put through a different type of spreader. Whereas once you get into a sand, um, it's a totally different oh, it's too. Okay. type of spreader. It's, you know, as far as being able to be a lot more capable of handling that heavy, dense weight. Yeah. I, I'm also very, the, the thing that makes me the, the most nervous about the snow is, Keith, what you pointed out, where, where people are quite easily going to have plowed their driveways long before we get to these sidewalks. And the, the buildup of plowed snow on each side of, of a driveway where the drive where the sidewalk is, 
that's going to get hard and freeze real fast, potentially. Definitely. Um, and that's why I'm saying, you know, it, it in some instances to say, oh, wait and do it 70, 48 or 72 hours after the storm. After a storm, it might be wet snow in in eight hours. The next morning, it's down at zero degrees when the, you know, when it clears out and everything's rock solid and you're not going to move it with any snowblower at all. Um, I know again, talking because uh, I've talked to, to Sunderland and they would, depending on the storm, when they got done plowing the roads, they will then decide which, whether they're going to plow or snow blow the sidewalks, depending on if it's a wet snow or a fluffy snow and they get right on it. Um, but again, they're, they're working with, you know, that 80 to a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment to and that's the same thing that Deerfield operates. They have at least two of them in, in Deerfield. So that's the magnitude of the equipment they have. It'd be the same thing like that Deerfield Academy has that the colleges all around have. You know, either a skid steer or a real small um, compact loader type machine that's meant to handle the heavy snows. Joyce, what do you think of this? Because again, we, we haven't plowed sidewalks with the old sidewalks. And this is a, a, I think this is a bigger issue than just dealing with it in a half hour select board conversation on October 20, whatever it is today. Um, I, I sort of wonder whether we should say we're not gonna plow the sidewalks for this coming winter under the auspices that we never have, but have it as a, a real ongoing topic for Keith, Brian, and, and whomever from the select board need to figure it out and come up with their best idea as to what, how we should proceed going forward. I feel less comfortable. Well, I guess we do the same thing because we haven't treated the sidewalks in the past with any kind of sand to, to do that, but I think these are going to be used more often. So I, I, I guess I'm, I don't think we, are ready to make this kind of a big decision right now and we're gonna to have to think about it. But so for the coming winter, we're, we're, we just don't do anything. Well, um, I, I mean, thinking of in terms of the, the do nothing or do some of the options that are here. <coughs> It it is an, uh, it's a more expensive option on the uh, on the scale of you know of dollars per year, but in terms of our experience, and we have very little experience in in doing this. If we were to try, it might be advisable to go with a contractor or a contract employee plus equipment kind of situation as a first try and see if we are happy with that kind of service. If we can't, then it might be at the end, we're not happy with it. And we put something in the, the capital equipment budget to get a piece of equipment that will do that job properly. But I, I agree, we're not gonna get that decision in the next 20 minutes or half hour, whatever we have left to discuss it here. Um, so it, I, I wonder if um, the, the, the realistic choices are do nothing, you know, and let the sidewalks not be uh, plowed for the first season and, you know, put up with the complaints uh, or see if we can find money somewhere in a budget to cover $6,000 worth of a contractor. Uh, and I know that's an estimate, right? For, estimate, for, yeah. That's an estimate. We don't know that we can get a contractor for that uh, amount of money. Um, but whatever we do the first year, we're gonna screw up in some way, right? Uh, and I think if we try to do it uh, you're trying to figure out the optimal way to do it with the, you know, what kind of equipment we, we might need to use. We might learn something 
we, I mean, we might do something the first year or we learn something that helps us do it better the second year. And, uh, and, I, and so I, I guess I don't really, if, if we can't find a contractor or a contract employee who comes with their own equipment, then maybe we should just say, we can't take this on with our current budget and let's figure out the right way to do this for next year. It may be we have to look at buying a piece of equipment like what our neighboring towns have done. And that's just not something we can accomplish in a couple of weeks. So I would open it up to either do nothing or pursue a contractor if we can find $6,000 somewhere um, to, uh, to repurpose for this out of funds that maybe weren't spent on account of uh, what a wacky year this has been. Well, what would happen if we at least attempt to get a more formal price from a contractor type thing? It doesn't mean we have to. We can we could actually solicit instead of just doing an estimate, we could solicit it type of thing and get something that'll give us a starting point. And then when we see what that number is, we may say, no, we can't afford it or yeah. That's a starting point. Um, another thing that Brian and I talked about, Brian had said earlier in my conversation, one thing that's good about the sidewalks, or I will say that's not the right word. One of the things that's key about it is it's not like we have um, kids walking. It's not something that has to be used. We're not pushing kids out into the street, um, things of that nature. It's not like it's close to the school type of thing where where people are walking. I mean, I, I just assume have them walk on the sidewalks and the street, but um, we're not in that position where they have to be used. Right. I, I guess I'm more comfortable with the contract employee plus equipment as opposed to a contractor. I think it's going to be more cost effective. I, I think that um, we won't be in competition for where do, when do we get our, our stuff our, our stuff done um as quickly and i know that the 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 quotes that i hear from other towns when they have contractors doing various parking lots uh, it just seems really expensive i know that what the town of deerfield pays a contractor <clears throat> to do the parking lot at the senior center is it's it's mind-numbing how expensive it is um I guess I'm fine seeing if we can find a, a contract employee who is looking for a little extra income um, and, 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 and seeing if we can find it and, and seeing the price. Keith, I got to believe that you have exhausted your snow removal budget the last few years. Yeah, well, last year it didn't. But um, again, I hear what you're saying. And yeah, maybe the, the contract employee with a, with a piece of equipment might be the route to pursue. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that the people will care between a contractor and a uh, contract employee because they both fall in the category of has the equipment. Um, one is a little less expensive than the other, but that's because you're renting their equipment. Uh, you know, but that's why it's eighty dollars an hour for a contract employee compared to twenty something for. A, town employees because you're you're really renting the equipment by the hour in there as well so yeah i think um uh i i i am uh, i i definitely we would look at a contractor with a lower price right um but i i don't make a distinction between contract employee and contractor when it comes to going out and looking for some options i think i think I, either should I, I think either. and again keith can yeah. Keith can speak for himself, but I think oversight of a contract employee is easier than oversight of a contractor. Oh. So, so what do we say that um, Keith, you go try to find yeah. a reasonable okay. price, but at, at least report back. I will report back at the next meeting. Okay, yeah. but at the same time, we also have to start thinking about how we're going to pr proceed. You know, because the reality is budget season is right around the corner. And once budget season starts, we will not have all the information that we need because we won't have gone through the winter yet by the time it starts. By the time it ends, of course, we will. But 
-hmm. Yeah. That leads to one other question is, and I don't know if Brian still wants an answer today, we've got to do something about what's going to be done at the, the to replace what Bill Smith was doing. Well, I'm not, I, I could be wrong, but I'm not sure that's a, a, a discussion for a select board meeting. I think that's a discussion that something you have to figure out and then, and then bring it to us. I think that's micromanagement at its nth degree. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yep. All right. Uh, I lost my agenda in all the ruckus here. What's next on the agenda, Brian? Waitley Center Woods update and discussion on needed culvert replacement. Okay, have at it. Well, as I can I'll jump right idea. in on this one. Um, as Jonathan, as you know, starting, I don't know, back in quite a while ago, you'd asked me to sort of monitor what was going on with the Kestrel Land Trust. And so I've sort of been monitoring what they need to do in regards to um, making the, the property accessible and replacing the culvert. And as of last as of last week, the Conservation Commission has given them their approval. They're just in the, the appeal period if nobody appeals it. And as long as DEP is OK with it, um, the culvert will be replaced with a the present culvert is 24 inch. It'll be replaced with a 36 inch culvert of which um, again, I was asked to sort of see if it was something that the town could do. Um, it is certainly something that I can, can do. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure as to when they want it done. That hasn't quite been determined, um, but I don't know other than that little bit of involvement I've had, I don't know whether it's advantageous for the town to do it. I don't know what the, you know, the, the cost offset of, of us doing the, the labor and, and um, equipment and the Kestrel Land Trust purchasing the materials. Um, I know that the town back at town meeting appropriated $60,000. I think it was $60,000 out of the um, APR money or the CPA money. Yeah. And I, I just don't know where that all fits into together because that's not my part of it. I was just sort of monitoring it to see if what needed to be done is something that the town could do. I think I'm lost. I don't understand why you, you... I, I thought you would just do this work when they say we're ready to do this work under the under the auspices of of, of you need to know that you have the the capacity to do it when they need it because what you have going on is more important than what they've got going on in a snapshot in time. Okay, yeah, I understand that, but is it is the work is what we contribute offsetting what we have to the town pays or uh, that's the part I have no idea. I don't think so. I don't, uh, I don't. I don't know for sure, and it probably is worth looking at. But I think the that that was basically for the purchase. It's my understanding is that that's where that money is going, um, and it's. Uh, I don't know for sure. Did they have as a part of that purchase budget also a budget for any improvements that need to be made? I don't know. So that's probably a question worth looking into. Do they have a budget for this? And what do they need from the town to make the improvements within their budget? My understanding, the issue here is really that this is um, on private property, albeit it's going to be available to the public, but it's technically on private property. So uh, the, the town doing work on the culvert there, we don't normally do that on private property, except maybe under some extreme circumstances. So I guess the, the question is, do we want to be able to try and offer our help on this uh, well, given that the, the land will be open to the public. I'm confused because we already right. committed to doing it. What's that, Jonathan? I, I'm confused and I apologize. We already committed to doing this. We committed to the purchase, I think. No, we committed to having our labor replace the culvert. 
Did, see, I don't. Oh, okay. I, when did we do that? I don't. I don't remember that. ever doing that. I only remember that I was asked to to look into it to see if it was something we could do, and it would be discussed. And and if you read Mark's letter, um, I, I think they are they still understand that. So. Okay, well, I always assumed that we were offering to do it on their behalf because it's just, it's it's time, and, and we would do it at a time when our employees had downtime anyway, and that was the discussion about whether you could do it or not, because there is, if there was no downtime, then, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't add more hours to the day, but it was always my assumption that we were offering to do this as an in-kind contribution um for this project to, to to work financially okay see and i was thinking in that that the town to do this was like a matching something or portion or whatever that's how i thought it was yeah. but again i wasn't involved in that i i think that if you were to have a conversation with alan who's obviously the chair of the of, of the uh cpc I, I think he would remember it as i'm discussing it yeah. okay yeah and maybe some of the other people who were um who were involved in that um in coming up with the project like i think scott jackson's really knowledgeable about it um i think uh oh who i've talked to like 15 different people about it but i remember scott jackson being very knowledgeable about it um uh and uh even some others you know, I, again, I, I can only speak for when when I was approached about would the town entertain this, um, and I said, sure, they we would entertain it, just but but I can't make that decision myself unilaterally. Um, but I was I was almost certain that that we we agreed to help out with 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 <clears throat> excuse me with labor. But I would talk to Alan Keith. Okay, I mean, again, it's it's one of those things. I'll, I, I'm just letting you know it's something that I can do, and if so, if you're telling me to do it, so be it. I, other, otherwise, I, I'm also was gonna say if it's, um, if it's not like a matching contribution to our side of it, what is the, what's the advantage to the town to do it? You know, other than I realize it's gonna be, what the the outcome of the property is gonna be. I understand that. Yeah. And that's what it was. It was a town. It was yeah. it was an asset to the town for townspeople to take to 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 benefit from. Um, <clears throat> it was an asset to the town, so the land wouldn't be developed and then shut off from everybody. And the cost of that was was labor, at a time when <clears throat> you didn't have other demands for your crew. Okay. Okay. And as I said, it, yeah. I I can definitely do it. I just. Okay. Someone's got to. Someone's definitely got to just tell me that yes or no. I I think it sounds like it's as long as this is coming at times when you have the the manpower to do it without uh, knocking off other needed projects for the town. Right. Okay. And I mean, at the moment, the way things are lining up prior to winter setting in, the the only thing that that I have lingering out there is we have to do the alternate portion of the Williamsburg Road culvert or Williamsburg Road bridges. And that is looking like within maybe three to four weeks. So I'm not, again, I don't know where Kestrel's timing is on yeah. purchasing materials. I mean, I, yeah. again, if we supplying the labor and the equipment if they're supplying the materials, I have no idea if they have that money budgeted. Yeah, so, we certainly weren't supplying materials. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So then, Brian, you want to reach back out to Mark? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we ask the APR, Brian. Yeah, so bear with me for one second. I got to read a notice into the record. And then I got to do it again for the other one. Um, so notice a proposed acquisition of an agricultural preservation restriction on property in the town of Waitley. 
October 19th, 2020, notice of proposed acquisition is hereby given to the chairman of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Waitley. In compliance with General Law Chapter 7C, Section 37, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, acting by and through its Department of Agricultural Resources, the department hereby gives notice that it proposes to acquire an agricultural preservation restriction on the real property identified herein for the purpose of protecting in perpetuity its superior and productive agricultural resources by preventing their conversion to other uses. The application received by MDAR indicates that the property is owned by Francis C. Sobieski and consists of parcels located at River Road in Waitley, as approximately represented on the attached map. The APR may encompass all or parts of the area shown. The current use of the property is primarily for blueberries. Following the recording of the APR, the use of the subject property is limited to agricultural use as more particularly set forth in the APR document, the General Laws, Chapter 184, Section 31 and the regulations of the department 330 CMR 22 and the following. It is signed by Michelle Padula, APR regional planner. Um, this relates to the APR, obviously that, that we're talking about on the Sobieski property. Um, so CPR contribution to pay for the town share was approved at the last annual town meeting. Um, so this is, this is really the beginning of the process for um, doing the closing on that um, restriction. Also related to this is, is the request from the uh, Department of Agricultural Resources that the board um, consent to a reduction of the notice period. Um, there's a 120 day notice period. Um, and I would recommend that if, unless the town doesn't want this to go forward that the board would consider um, consenting to the reduction of the notice period. And um, Senator Comerford also has a similar request. Um, so I would relay to her the decision of the board so that she can make a decision on, on hers as well. Why, why the delay? Why wasn't this done outside the 120 day window? Oh, of what was? Well, they're, they're asking for a waiver and, and I, maybe I'm missing something, but they're asking for a waiver of the 120 day waiting period. So it, so they need to wait 121, 120 days from the date of notice before they can proceed. That's what the law says. Right. And so, so you're why? you're allowing them to proceed at 30 days or however however long. Why, why why are we why are we being asked to waive that? That's what I don't understand. <clears throat> um, because it allows them to move forward with it quicker. Um, with the closing quicker. What kind of things could happen in that 120 days? Um, so I think if the town were not supportive of it, then the town may be able to, uh, or would have a period of possible negotiation with the landowner. Oh, okay. um, well, we've already decided we're supportive of this yeah, in the past of meeting. So, okay. I just wanted yeah. to, I didn't understand yeah. the and, and we don't know of any, any, people who are opposed to it, who are, you know, so vocal that they might do something in the next 120 days. I, I don't see any reason to, to put any more time roadblocks, so to speak, in, in front of, in front of folks. I, I, I really had thought the whole thing was, was kind of already done, but I forgot about this part where we get a chance again to, um, to do something about it, but uh, I think we're we're we should say yes. Um, I would make a motion to waive 120 days. Second. All those in favor? Joyce, aye. I'm sorry, Joyce. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay. Me, aye. Is that the extent of the vote of the vote we have to make, Brian? And then yeah, for, for this one, we got to do the whole thing over again. Okay, okay. let's do it. <clears throat> so you can zone out for two minutes if you want. <laughs> Notice of, so this is for Ashman, uh, the Ashman uh, APR. Notice of proposed acquisition of an agricultural preservation restriction on property in the town of Waitley, October 19th, 2020. Notice of proposed acquisition is hereby given to the chairman of the Board of Selectmen of the town of Waitley. In compliance with General Law Chapter 7C, Section 37, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts acting by and through its Department of Agricultural Resources, the department hereby gives notice that it proposes to acquire an agricultural preservation restriction, APR, 
on the real property identified herein for the purpose of protecting in perpetuity its superior and productive agricultural resources by preventing their conversion to other uses. The application received by MDAR indicates that the property is owned by Warrens S. and Nancy L. Ashman, trustees of the Ashman 2014 Revocable Trust and consists of parcels located at Long Plain Road as approximately represented on the attached map. The APR may encompass all or parts of the areas shown. The current use of the property is primarily for potato and butternut squash production. Following the recording of the APR, the use of the subject property is limited to agricultural use as more particularly set forth in the APR document, the general laws, chapter 184, section 31, and the regulations of the department, 330 CMR 22, and the following, signed by Michelle Padula, APR regional planner. And then the same question would apply in terms of the waiver of the 120 day notice period. I'm going to ask another question. Are we setting a price? I mean, have we done this before? Because I I don't recall ever voting on this, and maybe I'm wrong, but I've been doing this for a long time now, and I don't recall having this happen. I, I'm I'm wondering if 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 people are not. Is it is it my emergency? Is not your emergency, or is it is this going to become standard practice? Um, if I recall, the ones. Since I've been here, I they think the ones that we've done, the board has waived the 120 day. We've always had this question. Notice period. I believe so, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure it was always stated as a big separate thing. It was are we we were kind of deciding are we gonna do something or or not? If we're not, uh, sign this and it will go forward. And um so it might not have been explicitly set out as a separate question in the past. Right. So uh, I guess the, yeah. I guess the question would then be. Um, if this is standard operating procedure, maybe we should ask Senator Comerford to uh, file legislation that waives this 120 day window because no one adheres to it anyway. And, and, and save us time down the road. Oh. Because, I mean, this is, you know, if we always do it as standard operating procedure. What are we doing? Well, I think if, if you were against it, if a town had a reason to be against an APR, uh -huh. then you would have a little more time. And I think. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's worth filing legislation over. <laughs> I just, it just seems kind of silly to me, but I, I'll make a motion to waive the 120 days. Uh, the second. APR. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Me, aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Um, You filled the screen, Brian, and you took away my ability oh, to read the agenda. <laughs> oh, man, I've got an agenda here. So there. I mean, Joyce, what's up next? There we go. Um, the, to discuss and vote to adopt a social media policy applicable to all Town of Whiteley social media pages. Brian? And I have to admit, I got about, uh, I got through the first page and a half of this. And I then you all the way to the end. Then you fell asleep because it was so interesting. Right. Well, no, I just like I, I had to go get a COVID test and that sort of thing. So, <laughs> and then I got back to it and got like an yeah. So the, I, I got into the beginning, uh, and then I got to the middle of the second page before something else interrupted me. Yeah. So, I guess whether so the town has social media pages. Um, we can call them official or not official. I don't know that the board has ever technically authorized the social media pages, but we have them. Mm -hmm. um, Police department has them. I think they have an Instagram, um, Instagram account. Um, rec I think there's one for the Recreation Commission. I don't know that it's that that's up to date. The library has one. Um, Friends of Town Hall has one. Oh, that's not official, but right. And the fire department has one. Mm -hmm. um, so. The, really the two areas of concern are is that the social media page is essentially a, a public space. So when you create a public space, much like you do um, a sidewalk or a park, people have First Amendment rights and they have certain rights um, while they're in that space, even when um, it's done virtually. Um, the other concern is that in terms of public records and public record uh, retention, so uh, social media page comments that are written on that are considered public records. So if we see something we don't like or somebody says something mean about the town administrator, I can't just go and delete that comment just because I don't like it. Um, 
or any sort of other content based um, speech. So we're, the town is, is kind of exposed in a sense that we don't really have guidelines as to what's permissible and what's not permissible on the social media pages. Um, so the policy is meant to, to, to help help guide um, authorized employees who are allowed to post on social media pages on behalf of the town. Um, it lays out expectations um, as to what employees will will do with social media. Um, so it's really meant to kind of, I, I, I called it the Wild West earlier, um, the Wild West of social media. It, it's to try to rein everything in a little bit and make sure that we're we're doing things that as town employees on social media, that's not exposing the town to certain liabilities. Okay. Brian, has this document been distributed in a word format or just PDF? It was, it, so it was distributed in word format um, and it went to um, the department heads that have so existing social media accounts and we didn't receive any feedback. Um, well, we had a couple questions, but, um, we didn't really receive any feedback. And is part of, and I admit, I haven't read it. Is part of this feedback, or is part of the policy um, to create a one-way stream of information so that it does not allow for public comment? So we don't have to worry about deleting public record? Um, the way that it's written now, it does not say that. Um, I don't, and this is something we'd have to research. I don't know if Facebook allows you to disable comments on pages. I, I think you can make it so that uh, only certain people can post. Okay. And uh, that that's done all the time. Um, that I, I think that is a thing you can do. I have not used Facebook in a while, but it certainly was the last time I used it, something you could do on Facebook. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of, that would be my preference um, because it, it avoids the, the back and forth of, or the, the, the mess we could get into it, but, and that would be a change because I, I believe the pages that exist now um, are totally open. I believe, I believe anybody can post whatever they want on the, Lately, police department page. Right. Can you share yeah, the, Joyce the, and I in a word, word word format? Yep. Because I'd like to take a look at it and 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 at least make comments, if not redline. Yeah. Yep. Right. I think uh, what what the uh, policy does instead of like not allowing anybody to make any comments, it just says what comments can and can't be interpreted as like. You can't accept comments on a public hearing or a public meeting through a social media page. Right. Um, you can't um, do anything that's a formal notification or a request for public documents uh, unless somehow the you know the way the stuff's already posted. It's posted, but um, the um, that's right. The the and then there's the public records law one that this content is subject to Massachusetts public records law, um, including but not limited to uh, pages, list of subscribers and followers and posted communications. So we, we basically have to keep records of this, right? Yeah. Along with, I mean, we keep records of our emails and, and other things already. Um, so, I mean, those are the three points that I saw that really kind of governed comments. I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking about the idea where like nobody could ever comment and it's really just a one way stream. Then it's not a very social social media, is it? Well, it's, it's information purposes only. Right. Which, which isn't a bad thing. Um, I, I just, I, I just know that I've seen, we've all seen social media dialogue that becomes this endless stream of, you know, it, it, I, don't, I don't think that we want to create a new public common online um, because that does need to be 
uh, monitored so that people are not posting things that should not be posted. Um, and I don't think the town has the bandwidth to monitor that kind of, if it becomes exhaustive dialogue. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really worry about that, and it would have to be monitored because there are some things that obviously are are completely inappropriate, and they, we can't allow it to be posted. Right. Um, Up here in the purpose section, it says the intended purpose behind establishing Town of Boynton social media sites is to disseminate information from the town about the town to its citizens. So, if that is the purpose then having sites where people can't freely post seems consistent with that particular purpose. That, so, I mean, I, I mean, the policy as it's written does allow people to post comments, but um, to whatever extent it's practical, if we're really trying to make this a one-way uh, one road for information, then that wouldn't be necessary. But I'd also wouldn't, mind hearing um, maybe from people who have currently got sites um, where they do get comments, if that's been a good thing, if it's gotten out of hand, um, or if it would really serve us better to have our sites not have so much incoming comments if it's really supposed to be a way to get information out. Does that make any sense? Am I rambling? It's after eight, so. No, you're not. I just think that it's such a gray area. I, I think that's why I think, Joyce, you and I and Fred should should take a little bit of time to redline, make comments, and get a, and get our respective uh, thoughts back to Brian. Um, okay, yeah. I, I just, I know personally that I, I, I think that the minute you allow for dissemination of information from the general public, you can't monitor whether it's factual and we all know that social media is not exactly constantly being um factually based and you know and we don't have the capacity of the twitters and the facebooks to monitor this stuff and then and then delete if the stuff is found to be not factual so i i just worry about that so i, I would like to take a look at it and and make my comments and then we can discuss them yeah yeah okay. So you should have the you should have the word document yeah, now. Just come through. Yeah. So we'll put that on the agenda for next next meeting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, uh, Fred asked me if, if I could try to get uh, uh, Jim Savine to come in and give an update on uh, some of the um, some of the the going on with the police department. So um, I think he would be a good one to uh, provide input because I think they probably had it. It's probably yeah. the most active page that that. Among the ones we have. have, yeah, okay. Um, and I don't know what kind of pushback there'll be in terms of, like I said before, right now it's kind of the Wild West and everybody's doing, I think everybody's doing mm -hmm. a, a, a fairly good job, but I don't know if, I don't I don't right. know if comments are being deleted or I, I don't know, there's right. nothing yeah. to regulate what's happening right now. Right, and and I guess it would be okay if, if we have a policy that maybe all it really needs to happen there is that at the discretion of whoever's in charge of that site, you can make it one that receives no comments and it's just information going out. That it wouldn't necessarily have to be no social media sites can accept any comments. If like the police department is willing to do that referee work, so to speak, then that's that may be um, not something we should try to, to dip our fingers into. Okay. Um, yeah, and 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 again, it's 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 bandwidth of, of 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 town employees, and I think I'd be curious to know whether we get into a very gray area when we have a town employee trying to decide what comment he or she is going to allow and what comment he's not going he or she is not going to allow. And whether well, that's where the guidelines are actually um, helpful. They can say, "Oh, I can't have this kind of comment because." Uh, it's of, uh, I don't know, I think I remember a sexual nature. They, they can, that's unambiguous in the policy. You got to delete those. Right. But what about, so, what about, what about, but you'll, you'll see it in the word document. There, there's a whole list of, uh, things that are unacceptable. What about factually 
questionable statements. Uh, but I, you'll have to go read the policy. Right. But okay. yeah. All right. Let, let, we'll read it and let's move on and we'll, we'll revisit it in a couple of weeks. Um, That's good. Appointment to uh, play, to make to, to place Paula Jenkins on the Whitley Council on Aging. I move that we appoint Paula Jenkins to the Whitley Council on Aging. Second. Yeah, oh, chair. Sorry. I was waiting for Fred. Um, <laughs> all those in favor? <laughs> Joyce. Aye. Me. Oh. Yep. Okay. Um, town administrator. Um, Abbreviated updates. Everybody, everybody's sticking around for this one. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We talked about Chestnut Plain Road. That's essentially complete. Uh, Williamsburg Road Bridge. There's one bridge that's completed. There's one bridge that's still being worked on. Um, like Keith had mentioned, that sh should be wrapped up hopefully, you know, sometime uh, middle of November, end of November. Um, Poplar Hill Road. That's essentially complete as well. Uh, the drainage and the resurfacing there. Um, for the Mass IT grant, the Community Compact Mass IT grant, we submitted um, for the cost of $50,000 for the cost of the new public safety radios. So hopefully that will come through. With the other grant that we received, the um, CESFP, whatever it is, the, the supplemental funding for the coronavirus, um, we have received the electronic message boards. Um, we're getting those registered and those should be out um, out and available for us to use. Uh, we just need to get plates on them. Um, let's see. Uh, the planning board has scheduled a hearing for um, uh, zoning amendments for um, November 10th. They're proposing to rezone um, portions of or two parcels on state road <coughs> commercial and adding a uh, definition in terms of um, trucking. There's more information on the website. If you click on the calendar, November 10th, uh, November 10th, um, the information's there along with the agenda. So people can look at that. Um, it's that time of year where um, we're gonna be getting close to needing the tax classification hearing. Um, if you recall, that's when the board has to vote um, essentially to determine whether we'll have a mixed tax rate or a uniform tax rate based on classes, different classes of property, uh, residential, commercial, industrial property, um, open space property. Um, so I just wanted us to to have that in the back of our minds. I'll, I'll send out the information that I send out each year that explains sort of what the what the different options are um, so we can think about that. And if anybody wants any calculations done, it, it would, um, we'd, we'd probably want to get in contact, get um, in touch with the assess, assistant assessor to, to have any of those done if we're thinking about doing anything other than a uniform tax rate. Um, uh, tw uh, so the FY21 cherry sheets are out. That's our that's our local aid and local charges based on the governor's revised FY21 budget. Um, it's actually looking pretty good. Um, so the state aid that that was originally proposed back in last January, we're actually getting uh, more money than that. Um, there's it, it's higher charter tuition reimbursement, and I think we have one or two additional school choice students. Um, so we're getting school choice tuition. Uh, more than what we expected in the state, the state assessments and charges are are within a thousand dollars of what was projected. So, um, all in all, I think FY twenty one is going to be pretty uh, pretty good. Um, we'll have to see what FY twenty two brings. Uh, to that end, we haven't um, seen our uh, free cash certified yet, have we? Um, no, that was recently submitted, um, so it has not. Um, so the light in the town hall parking lot, that's been, that's been a, this ongoing saga that doesn't seem to ever end. Um, that's, we're actually going to have that turned off for a couple nights so that, um, our electrician can, can, can do some, uh, can try to think of some alternative ideas that would be less, uh, less bothersome to the neighbors. Uh, so if that's. Uh, dark for a little while, that's why. Um, I've been working with uh, Neil Abrams as, in his role as a cemetery commissioner. He and Darcy are looking um, for ways to expand the East Whateley Cemetery. Um, and one of the ways to expand that would be to uh, explore obtaining land um, 
from the neighbor, not the not the house, but the the farm fields that are back there. The the major problem with that is that that lands an APR, and it would require uh, the consent of uh, Mass Department of Agricultural Resources and um, a vote of the state legislature to re uh, to release a portion of that. Um, Neil and I had a conversation with with Natalie Natalie Blay on that and. We're going to be setting up a meeting to talk with MDAR uh, about that request. So that's kind of uh, something that's happening. Um, you know, we talked about the Christian Lane River crossing earlier. So um, I'm going to put the blitz on the, the Mass DOT Rail Division to see if I can't get a real person to talk to um, and get somebody out there because that's, that's really their responsibility. Mm -hmm. So. I don't want to get caught between the finger pointing with Pan Am and Mass DOT because that's not productive. And and Brian, I apologize for jumping the gun on that, but I saw someone on on the on the Zoom meeting that was interested in the project, so I thought I'd expedite it a little bit. On the I recognize that name as well. I know, and and they didn't leave, so I you know, but uh, but I was just trying to help out, so I apologize for for jumping the gun on that's that. That's all right. That's it. Okay, my question is, isn't it time to vote on winter uh, street parking? Oh, good. I'll add that to the next one. Winter parking ban. Yes. No on Friday, I hear. Yes, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, so there's nothing, we can do. there's nothing we can do if we get a lot of snow on Friday in advance, or how does that work? Um, I think... I mean, most, I think they'll be all right. I'd be surprised if they're plowing. I don't know. Halloween 2000, whatever, is not that far away. I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those. Joyce. Aye. Yep. Me. Aye.